demises of the characters and the plays. And now, a quick look at Alexander the Great. His father was Philip II of Macedonia. 5359, Philip II became king of Macedonia at 23. This is his father. Philip transformed the ragged peasants under his command into a well-trained professional army. So he rallied the troops in a way. And that's why he conquered Greece. And he was next planning to invade Persia. He conquered all of what is known as Greece. Philip II of Macedonia. So Macedonia is, you know, downstairs on the map. And he was ready to... He got everybody in Greece, but he was going to go invade Persia, which would be across the, one of the seas, but he was killed. And because he was killed, Alexander the Great uh, really was out to avenge his father's death or murder, Philip II. So he instantly proclaims himself as king of Macedonia. And after taking control of Anatolia, which is up above the Black Sea, he marched into Egypt. So he went down into Egypt, the Persian territory. So here we go. He goes into Egypt, gets them. The Persian territory was welcomed as a liberator. So as he goes into Egypt, it was <laughs> occupied, colonized, whatever, by the Persian. It was considered Persian. They would give Persia their taxes and such. But when he went into Egypt, he was liberating them. So obviously he makes a big enemy with Persia here. Here he was crowned Pharaoh and founded the city of Alexandria at the mouth of the Nile. They named and built a whole city in his honor. He was more interested in expanding his empire than he was in governing it. So he kept on conquering. His armies went all the way across the Indus Valley, which is above the top of India. And after winning fierce battles, his soldier morale was low. He was so far out in the boonies, and his soldiers had been fighting for 11 years, and they marched more than 11,000 miles. They marched wherever they went. So the exhausted soldiers yearned to go home, and Alexander, Bitterly disappointed, he agreed. When year after his return, he became ill with a fever and died. Now there's many theories about that, so that's another can of worms. But he was a month short of his 33rd birthday. Breakup of Alexander's empire. So after Alexander massively conquered a large area, one of the largest uh, empires, you will. <laughs> Empire. After he had conquered it, when he dies, what happens? This Hellenistic culture, which is the Greek culture, the people and their culture, it was so widespread that the era between Alexander's death and the Roman conquest in 147, 146 is called the Hellenistic Age. So, Alexander's gone, but what are all these people called? The Hellenistic culture. It's the Hellenistic Age. Until finally in 146, Rome comes in and takes them over. But the breakup of the empire was... This is after Alexander's death, right? The, event, the empire eventually broke into three generals. He had three generals, so his empire split into three. So this Hellenistic empire was three parts. Macedonia, Egypt, and Syria. By 200 BC, there are already Romans there. And how the Hellenistic company uh, culture spread among the many cities, the Hellenistic world, the African city of Alexandria. 
became the foremost center of commerce and Hellenistic civilization. Now notice this is right over at the mouth of the Nile, so you're talking Egypt. And since it was commerce, there's many people coming and going. So this huge Hellenistic concentration of culture is going all over the place vis-a-vis -vis the economy, trade routes, cultural flow, extended all throughout the Mediterranean. Attitudes are changing. So there's increased middle class and education. Roles of women were improved. Naturalized citizens, for example, Hellenized Egyptians or Syrian or Greeks. So Syrians were Hellenized Egyptians. They were Egyptians, they were Hellenized, they're Syrians. But everything, they're Greeks, everyone's Greek. Less bias over who's a barbarian. High Greek values faded. Novel books appeared. New books. Hellenistic religion and philosophy. Many of the arise the many kingdoms, the lack of the old Greek solid philosophy or very concentrated philosophy left people grasping at many new cult religions and new philosophies so it started to sort of disperse now there are four main philosophies the cynics who are scorn pleasure wealth and office live in tune with nature now if you look at cynic here it's an older version of cynic versus modern day use of someone being cynical if you look at cynics back in they were just like if you're just pleasure seeking or wealth grabbing you know or pride in your office prestige or anything you're just out for yourself and they were more in living in tune with nature it's a different version of what we know as cynic Hellenistic religion and philosophy, the skeptic, the same goes here. No real search for knowledge because everything is a state of change. So if you go searching and searching for that solid conclusion or that ultimate certainty, they're telling you, you're foolish, you're foolish because nothing changes everything changes nothing stays the same except for change everything's always changing and if you accept this you have peace of mind today it's more about doubting fact i'm a skeptic i'm debunking i'm doubting your facts prove your facts your facts aren't real so the modern version of this word skeptic in the ancient Greek version, which is everything is always changing. And if you accept this, you will be at peace. It's a lot different. The Stoic is kind of the same thing, but there was a famous uh, Stoic. I think uh, a Stoicism comes from if you just you stay steady and everything else changes around you. Uh, well, the famous sort was Zeno, and he was in Athens in 300 BC. Divine reason was his thing. So, destiny, fate is right. So you stay, stay centered. Everything changes around you, and basically, if it happens, it happens. Fate is always right. Kind of destiny and fate, and then if you get back into the Middle Ages, God's will, and God, it's sort of, there's kind of a connection. Hellenistic philosophies, Epicurean philosophy, Epicurious, avoid plain, seek pleasure by controlling your desires and wants. Hmm. If you want something and it gives you pain, don't want it and you get pleasure avoid pain <laughs> seek pleasure but but it's by controlling what your goals are 
happy with less. If you stop wanting all these things that you can't get, you'll start getting to be more happy. Remember the goal was happiness. Cynic, skeptic, epicurean, stoic have all slightly different flavor to the definition of the word in modern times. Always remember that. Mathematics and physics, Euclid, geometry, and the elements. Yeah, these perfect elements, the the circle, the square, the cube. Those are elements and they're perfect and therefore they're good. Archimedes used geometry to measure curved shapes, cones, spheres, and cylinders. So you have the basically the first person who starts to develop calculus, even though Sir Isaac Newton actually developed the mathematical calculus. Archimedes is doing it earlier with geometry. He develops pi. So if you ever wondered where pi comes from, Archimedes. The ratio of the circumference and the diameter of the circle. Of course, diameter to circumference. Medicine. Alexandria was a center of medicine and surgery, surgery advances. Learned the brain center of the nervous system. Hey, the brain is the center of the nervous system. Wow, they learned that in Alexandria. Anatomy was from executed criminals. They learned a lot from those that were executed. Quite delicate surgery for back then. Astronomy and geography. Alexandria's last renowned astronomer, Ptolemy, incorrectly placed the Earth at the center of the solar system. Everything revolved around the Earth. Thanks, Ptolemy. Look at flat earthers looking at, don't look at this guy. But he was a good philosopher, and that was his best thinking at that time. Characteristics of Hellenistic science. Two interesting points about Hellenistic science. One, it was done with simple means. There was no complicated devices. Like, how did they figure out the Earth's circumference? They did. Two, nothing much developed into applied labor-saving. So Hero invents a steam engine, it's a neat toy. Hero is a person who invented a type of steam engine. They just wrote it off as, oh, that's an interesting little toy there. They didn't develop it into an actual applied labor-saving steam engine. So SA2, SA answer. <laughs> What was the Hellenistic culture? Where, how, how did it originate? It was blending of Greek, Persian, Indian, and Egyptian cultures. So even though they called it Hellenistic, as in Greek, it was these cultures being, merging in with the Greek culture, and they just tapped it as all Hellenistic emerging into the cities created by Alexandria across his empire. So all those cities all across that Alexandria empire became Hellenistic. Created by the Athenians, outposts of Greek culture, these cities were linked together by trade and Greek culture and language. Commerce between them brought together many diverse peoples. They exchanged not only goods, but also ideas and beliefs. And that's a little end of Hellenistic spread of culture and how it got widespread through Alexandria. And one more side note is that Aristotle was the mentor of young Alexander the Great. Aristotle was his mentor. And actually, Aristotle once said, because, you know, when you're young and you're full of vim and vigor, <clears throat> and then you got the tutor trying to teach something to the young guy, and the tutor gets upset. So, Aristotle said of Alexander, impetuous youth. <laughs> it's like, and you could probably translate it into kids these days. Even Aristotle teaching me back then. Anyways, that's that. 
Allah.